How can organizations plan more effectively for future disruptions? What does tomorrow's workplace look like? How does sustainability boost business performance? These are just some of the global challenges facing business leaders today that we discuss in The Art of Smart. With analysis and insights that evaluate the quality of smart decision making against four significant factors, we look at some of the movements and trends emerging as imperatives for the majority of organisations, irrespective of location, sector or size. Throughout the year, we will develop the conversation with industry experts and thought leaders and regularly publish new content on smart decision making that delivers lasting value. The Art of Smart. To read more or to join in the conversation, go to crow.com forward slash art of smart. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Crow Learning Hour. Today, we are going to talk about what you should absolutely avoid in work emails. Before we start, I would like to bring your attention to our housekeeping rules. First, all microphones and videos will be disabled throughout the briefing. Second, please make use of these two boxes, Q&A box to raise any questions with regards to the training or presentation, chat box to raise any technical glitches in the Zoom room, in example, audio or speaker. The third one, last but not least, please do not share the Zoom link to unregistered parties as our capacity is quite full. Your cooperation is much appreciated. As for our speaker for today, let me introduce you to Ms. Lai Xiuping, the soft skills trainer of Crow CPE. Crow CPE uh, is a HRDF and MOF registered training provider under Crow Malaysia. She is currently a business English and soft skills trainer with more than 25 years of working experience in the professional services industry in Malaysia. Since becoming a trainer in 2011, she has conducted numerous training courses in English and soft skills program for Crow offices in the Asia Pacific region, including Malaysia, Japan, China, Taiwan, India, and for other Malaysian companies. In this webinar, Ms. Siu Ping will share with you on how we can improve our email etiquette by avoiding certain no-nos and by the end of our session, we hope you would be able to pick up some tips that you can incorporate and practice them into your professional email so they will appear both courteous and conversational. She will also attend to your questions posted in the Q&A box at the end of the presentation and wrap up the webinar with her summary. Without further ado, over to you, Zupeng. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. We can hear you. All right. Thank you. Um, let me share the screen. Thank you and good morning uh, to everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being with me today on my presentation on what you should absolutely avoid in work emails. Um, I don't profess to be uh, an expert in everything about email etiquette, but in my professional line, I have certainly written many, many emails. <laughs> and looking back, I do wish that I could turn back time and uh, take back some of the emails that I have written and um, uh, improve upon them. So what I'm sharing with you today is based on my own experiences through trials and errors. 
and also uh, through attending courses uh, conducted by uh, business communication experts and through my own research uh, when I started out as a soft skills trainer. Um, let's do a quick uh, poll question. <laughs> the first one would be, um, should you give someone a deadline to respond to you in an email? So Zhang, um, would you like to uh, start the polling now? So Zeng, can I can I move on to the next slide? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I see the results. 77% uh, said yes, and 23% said no. Okay. I will give you the answer when, when we come to the appropriate slide. <laughs> okay, that's fun. Let's. Um, one of the reasons I became a soft skills trainer, especially in the area of uh, communicating clearly and concisely in English, uh, was a quote that I came across by a very wise old sage who lived in China 2,500 years ago. And this is what Confucius said. He said that if language is not correct, then what is said is not what is meant. If what is said is not what is meant, then what ought to be done remains undone. And I find that this is so relevant in today's electronic age, especially with so many um, electronic communications going on. And language here um, can refer to the tone of our message, the accuracy of our message and the clarity of our message. So I think when we, when we are composing an electronic message, try to think about this code and um, it will help you. It will help you to, uh, to compose your message in a clearer manner. Um, what is email etiquette? Basically, it's giving thought to your email message to enhance your own reputation as well as your company's um, image. And amid the current COVID-19 situation, um, myself included, most of you I believe would be working from home. And when you work from home, uh, one of the most common platforms of uh, business communication is through the emails. And despite all of us having used email for many, many years, um, I think and I believe sincerely that uh, there is still room for improvement. And um, I, I still make mistakes and I have to remind myself um, to, to make sure that whatever I send, according to um, the latest definition of what is email etiquette, is um, a, an email should be courteous yet conversational. So um, no more writing using very, very old fashioned and stiff uh, manner of writing. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so why is email etiquette important? You may ask. Well, studies have shown that uh, the dangers of poorly written emails include trust loss miscommunication, no action taken or wrong action taken, time lost, tense situation and business loss. Um, one study shows that um, when you make errors, it really seriously impacts on how people think of you. So participants were asked to read an email with a lot of grammar errors and they thought that the sender of the message was less careful, less trustworthy, and less aware than someone who read the same email without any errors. And I think all of us 
uh, would feel the same too. If you received emails from a person who consistently make either spelling errors, typo errors, or forget to attach file attachments, you would kind of stop and think, okay, can I trust this person to work with me in my team? Or can I trust this person to be my service provider? As it looks like this person is not taking a lot of um, pride in his or her work. So dangers of poorly written emails, many of them, and we should try our best to avoid them. So let's move on into um, how to avoid uh, uh, situations of how we should avoid uh, writing uh, bad emails. The first one is called writing sloppily. And what do I mean by that? Well, what we should do to avoid writing sloppily, number one, always, always proofread every message that you write. Um, read, reread your message before you hit the send button. And um, preferably what I like to do is I like to read my messages aloud because I feel like I will be able to catch my mistakes uh, more efficiently when I read the messages aloud. Uh, don't just rely on spell check uh, because sometimes <laughs> you can't trust it 100%. A very, very funny example that Susie shared with me earlier was when she wanted to write uh, good morning, uh, uh, good morning associates or good morning colleagues. She ended up writing good morning as in spelling it as M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. <laughs> so very, very different meaning. Another um, example which I read uh, was this person said, um, she wanted to uh, send out a message saying sorry for the inconvenience cost because she used uh, spell check. It came out as sorry for the incontinence cost. And another email expert, uh, when I was reading her book, said she said, um, instead of saying hello, fellow uh, business uh, friends or whatever, she went and said hell, she forgot the O and it read as Hell, business friends. So again, proof reading, very, very important. Read, reread your messages. Second thing I want to address is regarding correct gender and email salutation. So we have to choose our email salutation very carefully. If you um, know the person quite well, you've communicated with the person either through the phone or you've met up with the person before. It is, um, I think it is fine to use hi and address the person's first name or good morning, followed by the person's first name. So it could be hi Susie, good morning Susie. If you are writing to this person for the first time, and if you are aware that they come from a more conservative industry, example, the regulatory boards like the Securities Commission um, or the KLSE, or you're writing to lawyers or to uh, bankers, then I would skew more formal. I would go with dear, Mr, Mrs, Miss, Madam, followed by the person's uh, name um, uh, in order to avoid any um, uh, unpleasantness. Um, again, uh, when I say gender <laughs> salutation, be very careful. Some names can be rather ambiguous. For example, if you if you received a business card without the gender salutation and it just re reads Chris Ho or Joe Lim, uh, don't assume that the Chris is a lady or a man. Chris could stand for Christina or it could stand for Christopher. Same with Joe, it could be Josephine or it could be Joseph. So a very simple way to make sure that you address the gender correctly is to call the company, check with the person who gave you this contact, uh, this person to, for you to contact or check their LinkedIn profile. And that, they, that will be able to help you uh, to address the gender correctly. 
correct spelling of recipient's name. Very, very, very important. <laughs> um, two of my bosses from my uh, previous company, uh, which is a big four accounting firm, actually told me that every time they receive an email, especially one where it's um, a selling, you know, someone is selling something to them or marketing something to them, if the person did not address their gender correctly, and I've received emails with uh, the person have called me Mr. Ping. <laughs> and have not spelled my name correctly. Like instead of a P-E-N-G, they've spelled it P-I-N-G. Well, these two bosses of mine told me that if they receive emails like that, they delete it straight away without reading. The reason? Well, Siu Peng, if these people can't take the time to find out who I am and how to spell my name correctly or whether I'm a male or female, then they don't deserve my business. So remember that correct spelling of recipient's name. We move on to number four, clear and direct subject heading. So many people forget that the subject heading in an email carries a lot of weight. So um, what's a bad subject heading you might ask me? A bad subject heading would be like just hello or hi or meeting. Doesn't tell you a lot, right? It's so vague. <laughs> Again, studies have shown that I think about more than 50% who of, of people who receive emails like that, delete them straight away. Uh, so what are good, what are examples of good subject headings? Um, ABC, Berhad, summary of our call on the 28th of May or um, ABC Berhad, you know, colon, or uh, meeting date changed, uh, ABC Berhad, um, a quick question on your presentation, ABC Berhad, suggestions for your proposal. So it leaves no doubt, right, if your, if your subject heading is so clear and direct that people know exactly what you're going to say in the email. Um, <clears throat> the next is correct grammar. Nobody likes grammar, learning grammar. I know <laughs> I've got uh, my students uh, in, in my uh, grammar classes that say, oh, why must we learn about grammar? And I tell them because the English language carries tenses. Whereas in the Chinese, in, 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 in the Chinese language and Bahasa Malaysia, there are no tenses. And tenses are very important in communication in the English language because we need to know whether the thing has already been done or is currently being done or will be done. So without Without knowing our tenses, we may convey the wrong message. Same goes with punctuation and spelling. What you can do to improve upon your grammar is um, we have encouraged people in Pro Malaysia to um, download the Grammarly app. So that's one manner to kind of at least uh, check on your grammar. Um, and of course, you can always sign up for grammar classes. Um, well, grammar classes uh, addressing uh, business, uh, business English. Another thing we should also be wary about is um, use correct, attaching the correct email address and uh, file attachment. So <laughs> one mistake that uh, I used to do <laughs> and which occasionally I still do is I forget to attach the file um, uh, before I hit the send button. Another thing is sometimes we are so uh, we are feeling so rushed over sending an email, and you may accidentally hit the send button again before you finished uh, composing your message. So, what experts advise uh, in this situation is number one do not attach the uh, email address until you have 
completed your message and attach the file attachments first before you compose your message. That will uh, definitely help you with these two uh, slip ups. And finally, um, under writing sloppily, do watch your abbreviations and your acronyms. Um, if you are so comfortable with certain legal, financial, or IT abbreviations and acronyms, don't assume that everybody knows what you mean. So um, be courteous enough to spell out the thing in full. Uh, FASB, it will be the Financial Accounting Standard Boards, uh, which not many people will know, but people in the accounting industry <laughs> would would know exactly what it means. So spell out uh, the word in full the first time, and then in, of course, close and in, in inverted uh, brackets, uh, the acronym FASB, and then you can use the acronym or the abbreviation uh, later on in your email message. So let's, uh, okay, let's do another, <laughs> sorry, let's do another poll question. Are emojis appro appropriate, sorry, not appropriated, uh, so, uh, it should be, are emojis appropriate in work email? So very quickly, yes, no, maybe, well, <laughs> this is an area where I think um, I've received a few um, queries uh, from, my, from my participants. Hey, Xiu Ping, what do you think of this? Well, let's see. Zeng, oh, uh, no answers yet or? Uh -huh. Okay, only 6% say yes, 65% <laughs> say no, and 25% said maybe. All right, we will also answer this later on. Okay, let's move on to another area of um, and and this is the the, the meat of the uh, of the the presentation uh, uh, rambling on and on so i think it's very important to remember that when we are writing an email we are not writing a a, a, a novel no or a, a sci-fi fiction story where you're going to be awarded a, a nobel prize or, or a whatever prize a literary prize huh? <laughs> Um, when we write email, especially for business purposes, um, one of the things that we should really be wary of or, or, or uh, take note of is to keep our sentences short and simple. And in my class, I call this the KISS principle, K-I-S-S. Keep it short and simple, keep it short and sweet, keep it short and sexy. And um, what do I mean by that? Okay. People's attention span, especially the millennials, the gen, the gen Zs, or what you call the gen Zx, or the gen Ys, are really getting shorter. Studies have shown, and what have they shown? That if you use seven to ten words in a sentence, ninety-five percent of people will understand you upon the first reading. If you use fifteen to twenty words. 75% of people will understand you on the first reading. Okay, still good. However, <laughs> if, you, if you write a sentence which contains more than 27 words, then you're in big trouble because only 4% of people will understand you upon the first reading. And I always remember my mother-in-law um, who was, um, she helped, you know, she helped all the small businesses uh, and entrepreneurs who, didn't understand English or Malay very well to fill in their income tax form. And she gave me this really wise saying, so I said, Siu Peng, time is money. Don't waste people's time, especially at work. And I always remember that. So how do we go about uh, writing sentences that are shorter and clearer and more natural? We cut out unnecessary words. 
we cut out unnecessary thoughts. <laughs> and I, I find that Malaysians tend to write very long sentences uh, from the people that I have encountered, from the people that I work with or I work for. Um, and I always see really long sentences. And in my class, I always tell them, break up the sentences, break up the sentences, because it's very hard to be able to understand immediately what you're trying to say if you have more than one or two ideas in a sentence. So some examples of um, how can we write in a more simple and natural manner is to cut out all these long-winded expressions. I told you before, right, that um, <laughs> sometimes I wish I could take back some of the emails that I've written. And I have, as a way to practice, I've actually gone back to some of my emails that were written in like 2006, 2009, 2010. And I saw myself doing exactly what is said here. And closed, you know, um, and closed here with is the attached report for your reference and perusal. Should you have any other further clarifications on the above mentioned matter, please do not hesitate to contact the undersigned. <laughs> so many words. Uh, well, just like Dorothy in, uh, <laughs> in the Golden Girls is saying, Oh, how long is this going to last? <laughs> really, really, how long is this going to last? So um, what I would say is um, cut out this very long-winded expressions. And many of this old-fashioned English, we call them actually old-fashioned English, um, very likely invented by lawyers. Okay, sorry, if there are any lawyers <laughs> in today's uh, uh, present webinar, I apologize. I don't mean to make fun of you, but these long-winded expressions were, were very, very likely, I read somewhere, I can't remember, invented by lawyers in the 17th or 18th century. And so what century is it, to, <laughs> is it now? So let's cut it out. And let's write in um, what, I, what I teach in the course, we call it how to write clearly and concisely, which means write naturally and sincerely. And I always uh, remind myself and I remind my participants to pretend that the person that you're writing an email to is actually just sitting opposite you. So how would you say what you want to say in that email? if the person is sitting just opposite you, face to face. I doubt you would say something like, enclosed here with uh, Mr. Mock is the attached report for your reference and perusal. I think very likely you would just go, Mr. Mock, this is the report on company ABC's financials. Please take a look, right? So. I'm pleased. So in an email, it could just come across more naturally as I'm pleased to attach the report on or the financial report on, you know, ABC Berhad. Should you have any other um, further clarification on the above mentioned matter, please do not hesitate to, to contact me. I think if the person is sitting opposite you, you would just say, please let me know, Mr. Tan. Please let me know, Inche Ali, if you have any questions on the issues that we have discussed. Call me on my mobile number or contact me on my email. On my email. So that would be more natural, more sincere, and it would come across as someone that you can uh, relate to more. <laughs> Conversational yet courteous. Um, I always remember what I read in one of the books that the two most polite phrases in the English language, the two most polite words or phrases in the English language is please and thank you. So as long as we have, um, we have stated, uh, we have used pleased when we are requesting for help 
or we're asking for a request. And when that help is given to you and we say thank you, you, you are very polite already and you don't need to use very long, bombastic words to, to, uh, to, com to convey your message. So that's uh, the area on keeping. Hang on, sorry. <laughs> that's on keeping sentences short and simple. Another thing relating to this is using more active voice. So there are two types of voices in the English language. One is called the active voice and one is called the passive voice. So in modern English, we are now encouraged to use more active voice in our written uh, communication. I will show you two examples, but very briefly, um, what an active voice means is you put the subject of uh, which is the person or the thing that's doing the action in front of the sentence rather than at the end of the sentence. Um, the passive voice puts the subject or the doer of the action at the end of the sentence. And how do you know that? Usually there's a by, huh? by so-and-so or by this thing or that thing. So two examples I can give you and um, you can take a look and see uh, which one you feel is clearer and, and is, is a smoother sentence. So in the passive voice, I would say something like, the following information must be included in the application form for it to be considered complete. Grammatically correct, nothing wrong with the grammar, but it's in the passive voice and uses quite a lot of words. In the active voice, it would just say, say meaning, there's no loss in the meaning. Please include the following information for it to be complete. So it comes across more natural, uses less word, and people spend less time having to read so many words. Second example, uh, your, uh, dear Mr. Tan, your report has been reviewed by us and your comments noted by us. Again, you notice the bye, bye, bye. So the doer is at the end of the sentence, change it to the active voice. It comes across more natural. Dear Mr. Tan, we have reviewed your report and noted your comments. Again, shorter, sweeter. Another area that um, we, sh we should be mindful of when we are writing emails is to keep your paragraphs short. I believe that um, most of us don't write extremely long emails, but once in a while, um, especially um, it, uh, when I was a consultant in Crow Corporate Advisory, we sometimes have to draft or write quite long emails you know, uh, to our clients because we either require information from them or we have information to relate to them. So in this, um, in this case, I do make sure or I'm very careful about keeping my paragraphs short. Paragraphs should roughly not be more than, I think in an email, although it says three to eight sentences, but I think in an email, three to five sentences, and, and if possible, if your report contains or your message contains a lot of paragraphs, put a subheading under each paragraph. Leave spacing between paragraphs. Well, we like to read things that are easy on the eye. And if everything is jumbled up and you're using fonts that are too big, too small, <laughs> too, uh, too hard to read, and um, it's, it's hard on the eye. So layout is extremely important. Make sure that you have proper spacing. And uh, most of you may come from companies where you do have uh, to abide or follow certain font size or and certain font, font types. So do adhere to them. Um, use list. And um, I love using list and I love using tables. <laughs> because um, in my job, I do, in my previous job, 
as a consultant, I, I have to give a lot of information or I need to receive a lot of information, both numbers wise and uh, uh, qualitative wise. So using list, when I require a list of things or stuff from my clients, I make sure that I don't write it in paragraph format, I list it down. The CVs of all the board of directors, bullet point one. And bullet point two, the CVs of the senior management. Bullet point three, the manufacturing process flowchart of your, uh, you know, of your product. Number four, the marketing strategies uh, to penetrate the overseas market. So I'm giving them in list form everything that I require. Uh, and and um, it's very hard for people to miss uh, uh, giving them the information if you list it down properly. And finally, um, check that you have stated your purpose and call to action. So what do I mean by that? Let's move on to um, a slide that I think is really, really, really important when we are composing not just emails, but any type of correspondences to, um, to somebody, okay? Um, this, I have to thank Shirley Taylor. She is an English communication expert based in Singapore. Um, she, she knows about Malaysian English, Singapore English, uh, and how we write, how we communicate. I attended uh, several of her courses in Singapore and I've learned so much from her. So I'm very happy to share the four point plan uh, with you here today. So the four point plan obviously contains four points. <laughs> So point number one, introduction, background. So every time we compose a message, um, email message, we have to tell the reader or the recipient why we are writing this message. It could either be because our boss told us to contact this person for a potential job. It could be you have met with this person recently regarding you know, a project or whatever. So you restate or you state why you are writing this message. Point number two, that's the meat of the message. You're giving details or you're giving facts. This is very, very important. Huh? I can't stress the importance of this part. So you're either giving the reader information or instructions, or you are asking for information and you are providing relevant details. It could be all three, or it could be one of the three, or it could be a combination of one, two, and three. And we have to ensure that the flow of our thoughts is logical, okay? <laughs> so um, providing that there was a question, I think uh, got somebody sent uh, earlier. So, uh, and, and you see, providing all relevant details is extremely important. And that's what I mean by accuracy and that's what I mean whenever my that you know the thing that my mother-in-law tell, always tells me time is money example I want to give you is um which I've discussed with with some of my colleagues for example if you if you receive an email message which tells you hi Suping uh, please pick me up at the airport my flight arrives at two um Think logically, huh? please pick me up <laughs> at the airport. My flight arrives at two. Do you think, uh, <laughs> do you think Siu Ping will be at the airport to pick you up? No, because although the sentences are grammatically correct, however, a lot of information is missing from that email, right? When are you arriving? The day and date is missing. The time too. Is it 2 a.m.? Is it 2 p.m.? <laughs> no idea. Where is the airport? Most cities have more than one airport. What is your flight number? What happens if your flight is delayed for five hours? Can you imagine? The person who is picking you up from the airport will be waiting at the airport for you for five hours. So provide all relevant details. Um, I, I, I always tell my fellow colleagues, 
um, and, and also my, 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 my students that whenever we send out an email, uh, what we want the reader or the recipient to do is if we, you know is to be able to make what we call an informed decision the person must be able to say yes or no to what you've written or to then carry on and do what you have requested and to come back to you so that you then can make an informed decision so whenever we send out emails we must always remember what I have given to my reader or readers, does it allow them to make an informed decision? So conclusion, so bear that in mind. Conclusion, point number three. Yeah, what do you want the reader to do next? You have to explain to them after you've given them all the relevant details and instructions. Giving a deadline, oh, I think, uh, <laughs> yes. So it's very, very important to give people a deadline and um, not just go ASAP as soon as possible. Why do I say that? Because um, it reflects on you. Yeah, if you give pers a person a deadline to come back to you, it also shows that you have a schedule and you know when to do what. Your, your you know, it shows that you're a more responsible person. Um, some of my colleagues have told me when I tell them, don't write ASAP anymore. Huh? Just, just give the person a deadline. Uh, please, like I said, please and thank you are the two most important words in the English language. So if you tell the person, please uh, let me know uh, or please give me your answer by the 28th of May, no one is going to accuse you of being rude. Um, and a very good example, <laughs> I always tell them and say, and they always tell me, oh, yeah, you think you're right. Huh? Is I said, when you receive a wedding invitation card or you receive a, a, a birthday invitation card, and, and even if you, if you send a wedding invitation card to the president of America or to the prime minister of Malaysia or to the Pope or to the Dalai Lama, on the wedding invitation card, you would still have RSVP 28th of May, 2021. You won't put RSVP as soon as possible, right? So if it's not rude <laughs> to put a RSVP date in a wedding invitation card and it's going to people of, you know, celebrities or what you want to call them. <laughs> so why, should, why would it be rude to say it to uh, your clients, your service providers, your business associates? And... Um, under conclusion, uh, we also will look at what action will you take. You have to also inform them, like, once I have received the information, um, what will I be doing uh, in order to help uh, all of us complete the task or the project? And of course, finally, we call it the close. Just a simple one-line closing sentence. Thank you. I look forward to hearing from you. And that's basically the four point plan. Really, really easy to remember. Um, it's very effective to implement. And I hope that you will use this uh, in future for your email and other simple uh, written communication. All right. So. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Trigger happy fingers. Watch your manners. Let's come to this part on um, watch your manners. Um, the first thing we need to do uh, when we write again, because we we lack the the face to face communication, as in uh, can't really see the person's uh, body language or gestures. And neither can we be able to gauge how the person is feeling through, through the, the, the spoken language, huh? through the tone, the intonation, uh, the speed and, and uh, the clarity of the voice. So we have to be extra, extra careful um, when we are um, communicating via email. So the first two, the first two things that we need to take note is to use a positive tone as much as possible and to uh, show empathy, okay? And what do I mean by using a positive tone? 
Okay, let's look at this example. Huh? Um, example one, a less positive tone <laughs> would be telling somebody, hi, blah, blah, blah. We cannot do anything about your problem. You have to call so and so and so from another department. And I, I have received emails like that in the past. And, and um, well, you just don't feel very nice about it, right? Uh, I, well, yes, maybe the person really, really cannot help you. But there is a better way of putting it. Um, I'm sorry that we cannot help you with this. I believe uh, Ms. Tan, Ms. Uh, Ms. Lee or uh, Kay Zurina from which department may be able to provide you the solution and you can actually give the contact name and address of the person. Uh, that's watching your tone and being a little bit more empathetic. Huh? Um, showing empathy also means using a little bit more uh, what we call visual language. Visual language will be using, um, especially if we have to say no or it's something we can't do, using words like, I see what you mean, Miss Tan, but I'm afraid, um, you know, I don't have the ability to help you. I understand how you feel, Inche, uh, inche Maniam. Uh, or sorry, Mr. Maniam or uh, Inche Hassan. Uh, but, um, um, you know, I understand how you feel and I will try to see what can be done about your proposal. Okay, so that's using what we call visual. I see, I understand, I, I feel. Example two, uh, your assistant gave us the wrong color code for the product. So it's not my fault. You just have to wait for the new shipment lah. Huh? <laughs> so, um, yes, yes, yes. So my assistant did make the mistake. Huh? But uh, a better or a more polite way, a more courteous way to put it would be there was some miscommunication on the color code and we were given the incorrect code. We will arrange for a new shipment and give the person a date. So these are just two um, examples uh, of, um, of being more careful with your tone of voice in an email and with being more uh, uh, showing more empathy. Let's go back to, okay, keep mm, cap lock off. Um, extremely important. Um, I think I'm sure a lot of you do know about this. Uh, keeping, when we, <laughs> when we type using capital letters uh, for most of our messages, um, this is what we called in email etiquette language, shouting. It's like you are shouting. Uh, uh, sometimes I do shout at my son like, don't do this anymore, or why aren't you? <laughs> so, and who likes to be shouted at, right? At work, nobody, <laughs> especially if you've not done anything wrong. So if you have something really, really important that you want to highlight in your email message, I suggest uh, maybe underlining that particular word or phrase, and you could bold it too, but, um, email should be written in sentence case, huh? not, uh, well, not, not in cap locks. Cap locks are, are written when there are real, there are, you know, real dangers happening or lurking around you, like danger, uh, you will be electrocuted. So, so um, I, I don't think you'll be sending messages like that. Excuse, excuse me. <clears throat> Um, another thing uh, we should be, be careful about <coughs> is when we are forwarding a lot of email threads, <coughs> you know, and um, <coughs> excuse me, when we're forwarding a lot of email threads, it's important that um, you get the permission of the person who wrote the original email before you forward the thread. And um, I think if the email chain is really long, <laughs> it's been forwarded uh, 
and, and the, the last person that you're forwarding to, or even before, you know, after the first or, or two chains, it's only polite, I believe, to kind of summarize like exactly what the thing is before you forward to a new recipient. So it could be just like, uh, hi, you know, hi, Joe, hi, hi, hi Mike. Um, um, uh, I thought you would be interested or you would like to know what's happened to our project on dot, 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 dot. Um, we, have, uh, we have managed to uh, secure blah, 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 blah. And then if you would like to have more details and more information, please see the following emails. So it's polite to give a summary and not just go, please see email below. And the poor person has to read like 50, different email chains to understand what is going on. All right, um, so that's uh, some food for thought about forwarding. Um, another thing is don't hit reply or unnecessarily. Huh? So <laughs> I'm sure you have received, sometimes you have received so many emails, huh? you've been CC'd on so many emails and um, do, and you, you think to yourself, do I really need to be in this loop? Do I really to know, need to know about everything? And um, so give a thought, give a thought. Um, one, one thing I, I think uh, would make it clearer about, you know, carbon copying or what could that courtesy copying somebody is at the, if you're sending out an email for the first time to uh, where you have two the recipients and you are seeing several recipients, um, is to at the end of the email just to ask the people that you have copied whether they would like to be in the loop for future emails, or if they feel that they they have sufficient information for the moment. So that will take away a lot of. Um, uh, um, the unclarity, you know, uh, about whether uh, should this person be copied or should I copy this person? So you would know the person may just say, keep me updated once a month rather than, than copying me on every single uh, email uh, that has been sent. Uh, the other thing about uh, reply all unnecessarily is okay if, um, especially if um, you are sending an email, uh, you are re replying to an email and you are correcting someone's work um, and on the carbon copy is uh, your bosses and you and the uh, recipient are about the same rank, uh, rank and file or, or maybe, you know, in the company, same position, whatever, uh, what, what you want to call it is um, don't don't reply all, especially if you're highlighting someone's uh, mistakes. Um, th this happened to um, a former colleague of mine in in the in one of the in the big four firm that I was work working. Uh, we were in a team, and and every time um, one of us uh, made mistakes in our reports or in in you know in our work, uh, the person would highlight our mistakes and CC our bosses. <laughs> so guess what happens? Nobody wants this person to be on, on the team project anymore. And um, it created a very tense and un unhealthy situation in the department. So think very carefully about uh, reply or what you can do, of course, is if the person do make mistakes, take it offline. Yeah, email the person directly or call the person or come ask the person to come, you know, come see you and say, uh, you know, look, there have been several mistakes that you've made. Um, and, and I think this is how you should improve upon your work. Um, and, and that would be uh, create a more healthy situation. Do reply to email wrongly sent to you. <laughs> yes, uh, sometimes you say, ah, well, it's not my problem, right? But <laughs> again, this is what we call email etiquette. So if a person did by mistake sent you an email instead of, uh, of another person, I think um, I have a friend who works in Citibank who has the same name as exactly the same email address as 
another person who works in Citibank London. So my friend works in Citibank KL and the other person who has the same name as her works in Citibank London. And they keep getting each other's uh, <laughs> emails. So of course the polite thing to do is to write to the sender of the email huh, to say that um, you have uh, you have actually uh, uh, contacted the wrong person and and um, you know I'm not the right person. Uh, that's that's the polite thing to do. So don't give the silent treatment. Don't give the silent treatment. Finally, under watch your manners. Okay, respond in a timely manner. Oh, before I forget, BCC. BCC, in my honest opinion, should only be used when we are blasting emails to a lot of people that don't know each other and we don't want to, uh, it's unprofessional to, to, to let others see the, the recipient's email address. Other than that, if you're working in a team, um, uh, on a project, you know, um, I think we should avoid using BCC as much as possible. Um, I can't. I don't. I know there's no reason. Huh? There's no reason to um, to want to hide. Uh, we we have to be, like I said, as truthful and honest uh, uh, in our uh, working life professionally. Okay, let's move on now to respond in a timely manner. Um, so I think there was a. I can't remember whether it was a question or not, but um, responding in a timely manner. Okay, so a lot of different opinions about this. Um, some companies would have uh, a culture on this already. Huh? They would have an email corporate culture on when do you need to, like, for example, when I was in corporate advisory in Crow, we were always told that we have to respond within 24 to 48 hours. Doesn't matter if we know the answer or not. Within 24 hours, if we don't have the answer immediately, just to let our client or business associate or, or you know, or whoever knows that, yes, we have gotten your email and we will come back to you and then give a deadline, not as soon as possible, huh? give a deadline. So. Uh, most experts uh, in, in this uh, section or in this field say that if you receive an email uh, within your immediate teammates, do respond within 12 hours. Huh? Um, if it's just general colleagues not working on a specific project with you, then 24 hours is fine. If it's external contacts, this is, this all depends how important that uh, sender of the email is to your company. So uh, it says that if it's um, someone very important and you're working on this project, yeah, respond could be within two hours, within seven hours. But if it's um, a very general inquiry and, and you don't know this person well, then um, let's say if you received an email on Tuesday, you can you can um, you can write back to say that uh, you will respond maybe by Friday. Um, in real life, um, what I've done is I've actually Googled <laughs> something called emailanalytics.com. They they tell they monitor <laughs> the response time of work emails I, I tell you these people are fantastic i don't know how they do it but they act, they found out that excluding weekends and holidays i'm quoting email analytics huh? actual response time for professional emails i.e emails um, taken from uh, uh, professional uh, pro professional email addresses roughly seven hours 46 minutes Work hours response time, two hours and 40 minutes, i.e. they, um, you know, they take away the weekends and, and, and the what. So it looks like people do respond quite quickly now to, to emails. Um, I guess another thing is when you're working in Malaysia for a HQ, 
uh, that is based overseas, then I, I think it's only logical and uh, reasonable and, and common sense to then check with your bosses overseas uh, how fast they expect you to respond to an email. Uh, if there's like time differences of 12 hours, seven hours, and um, you know, so, so that's, that's also very subjective depending on the, the company culture. But I think if you're within Malaysia, um, then if you send an email, I think uh, past uh, 5.30, 6 p.m., um, I, I think it is only um, reasonable <laughs> to expect your colleague or, or you know, your, your staff to respond the following, the following day. But, Again, I said this all depends. I remember, um, <laughs> I remember when I was in one of the big four firms. When I was in the big four firm that I was working on, we um, there's this very very important uh, client of ours, uh, one of the largest at that time uh, conglomerate and PLC in Malaysia, and um, our audit partner was actually given a dedicated phone. <laughs> <laughs> a dedicated phone so that the CEO, I can't remember if the CEO or the executive chairman of that company can text the person and send emails or WhatsApp or whatever you call it or, or uh, uh, the person 24-7. So I, um, <laughs> I'm not very sure about that, but, but again, so like I said, it all depends. So it's it's good to work all these things out um, at the beginning of a project uh, uh, to, to contact the people that you're working on in the team. And if you are um, quite junior in the rank, um, just ask the people more senior, like uh, what is the response time that is required uh, for this particular project? Or, or what is the corporate culture uh, in this firm? for response time, for uh, general emails, for uh, uh, project-related emails. Okay, so that's on uh, uh, manners. Uh, what else can I cover? Oh, okay. So the other thing will be, yes, out of office, triple O replies. Out of office replies. Um, it will be polite to, of course, send an out of office reply if I think if you're away for more than one day. If you're just away for one day, maybe not necessary. And what should be contained in your out of office reply should be the fact that um, you should um, tell the person how long you will be away. And if the matter is really, really urgent, uh, you can then give the, a number or a contact of uh, your fellow colleague who will be able to uh, hopefully help this person out. And, and very importantly is of course to, to inform this, uh, this colleague of yours uh, that uh, this person will be um, helping you to, to monitor certain emails that are coming in when you are away. So that's it. You don't have to really divulge too much information huh, other than just, and, and I think with this too, um, many firms have their own um, OOO replies. So that should be fine. Okay. Um, now we move on to watch your email tone. Okay, watching your email tone. Okay, <laughs> um, if you look at the six phrases here, you should know that you failed to. It's not my fault, never my fault. Because you refuse to do this, that's why I can't do this. Lah. Uh, we cannot be expected to help you. Huh? And I must insist that. So these are very um, strong, aggressive tones, and um, we should try. We should try to tone it down. Huh? Uh, and 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 if you find yourself using any of these phrases, there are many ways that you can rephrase. Like I said, showing empathy in the earlier slides. I understand how you feel, however, um, you know, or it's not my fault. <laughs> uh, there was 
okay, really not your fault, the fault of the company or the person who was sending <laughs> you this email is just say, yes, uh, there, there were some miscommunications or there was some miscommunication on our part um, and uh, let's move on and see how we can salvage the situation. So that's how we can uh, make the, uh, the unhealthy situation uh, healthier. Um, some words that we try not to use uh, will be like, I have noted that you made four mistakes. Uh, there were so many issues in your report or using a lot of adjectives like you were very, very, very uh, late, you know, just say you were late. You know? <laughs> so don't need to use so many adjectives when describing negative situations. Um, another thing about tone is, you can copy the person's tone, especially if you don't really know that person well, and uh, you're communicating with the person for maybe the first or first time or second time. And this would also cover cross-cultural communication. Huh? Certain cultures are warmer. <laughs> People, uh, I think uh, Asians are generally tend to be warmer. Um, and we, we um, uh, we tend to maybe write in a more uh, informal manner, whereas uh, certain cultures in the West tend to be extremely formal. So let's, uh, from the emails that you have received, you can gauge um, like how to respond in return. Huh? So like, do you still continue like going dear somebody, 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 or you can, uh, after a, a several emails, you can actually go hi, uh, so and so and, and using the person's first name. So it depends on um, if, if, like I say, if this person is, a, is an important client or, or comes from a, a company that you've not dealt with, um, follow the style of the person initially and then, and then you can gauge and, and, and see how it goes. Um, and of course, um, don't cross professional boundaries, uh, don't cross professional boundaries. Um, don't lash out in the heat of the moment. Okay, so very, very funny story that I want to share with you was when I was in the big four firm, uh, my boss received an email which wasn't very nice. Uh, I, think, I think the other partner was saying something I, I can't remember. And then uh, she, she wanted to vent it out to me. And so uh, she wrote out, she wrote an email and, oh, I don't know what happened. She actually sent it to me and CC'd that person. <laughs> so, so the minute she hit the send button, she realized what she, has, she had done. So she called me and went, Xiu Ping. <laughs> and I said, yes, I can see what you have done because I'm reading her email. <laughs> and uh, it was really an unpleasant situation which she had to untangle huh? because obviously <laughs> obviously she she received um, a very unpleasant phone call uh, from from her fellow partner so don't lash out at the heat of the moment step away yeah? take well how many ever deep breaths you need 10 deep breaths 20 20 deep breaths, go have a coffee, make yourself a cup of coffee, or walk into, um, well, well, we can't be walking into our, our fellow colleagues' rooms now. Just walk away, um, look at something pleasant, and, and just, just uh, look away from that email. And then I think most of us, um, we are humans, right? Uh, we are all, all human, so um, of course, uh, uh, when somebody writes something nasty to us, we feel anger, we feel upset. And, but if we walk away, uh, there's more clarity. And, and I think uh, the, the, we won't lash out. That, uh, we, we definitely would not lash out at the heat of the moment. Crossing pro, uh, not crossing professional boundaries also include not gossiping about colleagues, bosses, about the needs of clients. Very, very important. Um, and email is traceable huh? just remember huh? an email i think uh i think somebody from the cia or fbi i read somewhere told us told a, a politician in america that 
every single electronic message can be traced. So for your own <laughs> reputation and for your own sake, never, never gossip. Huh? And of course, um, don't use inappropriate humor. Um, something that is funny to us may not be funny to, to somebody else, especially when, it, when it's regarding race, religion, politics, or, or uh, being very sexist. So, so don't use inappropriate um, humor. So, um, like I said, at the end of the day, <laughs> electronic communication just aid us. Huh? Uh, it, it's really now the, uh, uh, the most widely used uh, platform for, for business communication. However, if you feel like, oh, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, you've been sending so many emails and nothing seems to work, don't panic. <laughs> Can always pick up the phone and call the person and go like, hey, hi, Mary. You know, uh, I think it's good if we could meet up face to face through Zoom or we could just have a chat over coffee and, and, and uh, maybe we could have a better understanding of what is required in this, in this project or, or job. So nothing sometimes, you know, uh, because again, like I said, an email we lack, if we don't have the ability to, to uh, read the tone, uh, the clarity, the, the accuracy, a lot of things can go wrong. Um, so my last slide. <laughs> so I started the first slide by sharing with you a quote from a wise old man that lived uh, 2,500 years ago and which I feel and I always remember, I keep to heart and I think it's so relevant today. And for my last slide, I want to share with you a quote from uh, one of the uh, chairman of one of the largest IT companies in the world that helped to kickstart the uh, IT or techie revolution in, in business. And this is what he said. So Sir Lou Getzner was the former chairman of IBM. And he said that yes, computers, including our pop, 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 our tablet, our PC, our laptops, they are really magnificent tools for the realization of our dreams. But at the end of the day, no machine can replace the human spark of spirit, compassion, love, and understanding. So I think this is such a beautiful and lovely phrase. And I think that's how sometimes when we start to communicate uh, with email, um, just always remember courtesy, uh, conversational, right? You know, naturally and sincerely. Um, and and um, that you you really really cannot go wrong with that. So thank you all <laughs> for your uh, for being here with me. I, I'm so happy to share what I know with you. And I think um, Susie or somebody will take over. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Okay. Thank you, Xiuping, for an uh, interesting presentation. I think I have done quite some of the mistakes that highlighted just now. <laughs> so I believe, <laughs> yeah, I believe the I others probably have done similar mistakes. So yeah, that is why we need to keep on learning and then I'll find out what we can improve from this, right? Yes, yeah. I am still learning. I'm still learning. And, and in the Q&A sessions, I, like I said earlier, I am not perfect. I don't know everything about email etiquette, but I have the, um, I will try and help you as much as possible. If I don't know the answer today, I promise that I will come back to you uh, by the mid of next week, huh? because this is what I really believe in. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll have a look at the questions that posted in advance by some of our registered okay. participants. Okay, All right. question number one. Is it proper to send emails out after midnight or be expected to respond to emails sent after midnight? So this question, again, um, depends on if you're, are you working for a 
multinational company um, based overseas. Um, an example I want to give you would be like, for example, my husband is the regional executive of an uh, international firm and the chairman and is based, uh, hang on, I can't remember, London or America or <laughs> something like that. So, well, sometimes he is expected uh, to respond to emails overseas because that is, uh, that is already highlighted in his job function. Uh, this job function, well, HQ is there. So we work according to the HQ working hours. Um, if it's in Malaysia, um, <laughs> I think it would be nice to allow your staff to be able to have a good night's rest. <laughs> so, um, you know, studies have shown that uh, most of us need at least six to uh, at least seven hours of, uh, of uh, restful sleep in order to be able to function well <laughs> at work or whatever. So um, responding probably the following day uh, would, would be the, 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 the correct professional etiquette to do. Okay? Okay. And then we move on to question number two. Is it necessary to reply thank you to the relevant person and copy everyone in the loop? Answer is no. <laughs> just thank the person who sent you the mess who sent you whatever relevant details that you need you don't have to cc everyone nope <laughs> all right noted <laughs> let's go to question number three how should one organize emails in the inbox i am moving emails of similar subject to one subfolder but finds this a chart especially if sender cc me just for info okay so this I can't really answer because I think this is more towards not the soft skills of email etiquette, but more on the IT techie side. And, um, um, you know, it, it would be good if you could check with your, um, in, in, I think in Crow, we have someone called like the IT director or the MIS director uh, who, who will be able to assist in a question like that. Um, if, you, if your company does not have an IT director, what I did was I briefly Googled, <laughs> I briefly Googled and did some research and talked to Andrew Wu, who is our IT director. And he says, uh, Microsoft Outlook has a lot of um, apps or whatever you call it, who can, uh, and they, they can really help you, okay? To, to organize your folders. For me personally, when I was a consultant in Crow, a corporate advisory, I organized my folders according to my task. So it would be like, if I'm working on a business plan for ABC, I will have a folder just based on ABC, Berhad, on XYZ Berhad. So, um, and, and <laughs> uh, um, I still use a written diary. Uh, I find it extremely, 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 <laughs> again, I'm using too many adjectives, <laughs> but I write everything down in my diary. So I know when and what I should do. And I think the written word is, is very powerful. Huh? Uh, so it, it does help me uh, with managing my inbox as well. Like, oh, okay, as I reply to this person, I can put it aside and it will be all, all to, be, uh, to be advised or, or something like that, huh? outstanding emails. Okay. Okay, we move on to the next question. Uh, should we make the email more interesting by adding some pictures or images? <laughs> I often worry about wordy emails. Uh -huh. Remember the KISS principle? Whoever wrote this to me, keep it short and simple. So yes, uh, if you are in the professional line, don't add emo okay don't don't add emojis or images. But if you are in the mass communication department, or is it, uh, uh, yeah, the, the marketing department. And it also depends on your industry. Are you in maybe the fast moving consumer goods industry? Are you in the financial services industry? Again, it depends huh, on your industry and your business. If you're in the FMCG industry, yeah, well, why not use some pictures and images to email blast 
um, you know, something that you want to sell. And even for, I think for Crow internally, Susie, if I'm not wrong, if, uh, when we used to have annual dinners, <laughs> when we yeah. were able to organize annual dinners, the mass com, you know, department will email blast like, oh, the theme for this email dinner is like, this annual dinner is blah, 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 and show you some pictures. So again, depending, depending. Uh, but like for me, uh, in my job as a consultant, I would very, very seldom uh, post uh, images or pictures unless it's related to the project. The floor plan, uh, of of uh, you know uh, the the factory or something that I need them to uh, uh, to let me know exactly where are the different machines being placed in 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 the operations. Okay, okay, thank you. And then we move on to the next question. Can we insert uh, emojis <laughs> in our reply to our colleagues on casual topics? So the answer really is maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, Maybe I think again, <laughs> if you, if the email is regarding work, then, then no. Huh? But if it's just a casual email to your colleague, hey, where can we have lunch? Huh? Or hey, time for lunch now. Where do you want to go? Fine. Just post an emoji. But if it's regarding work, like, you know, hi, Susie, can I have the, uh, can I have the latest report on ABC Berhad by uh, tomorrow evening, then there's no need for an emoji, okay? Yeah, there, there's no necessity for an emoji. Okay. Again, culture comes into place, huh? Culture, so if your client sends you a little cute emoji, <laughs> then after a few, keep sending you a emojis, then maybe, yeah, just reply with one. Okay. Uh, then we move on to the next question. How to handle co-workers who don't use email to communicate on work-related matters, but prefer using social media apps? Ooh. I think it's on <laughs> via WhatsApp, probably. Uh, yep, okay. How to handle co-workers who don't use email? I think um, this would have to be a company-wide policy, <laughs> right? Um, again, depending when you say work-related matters, if it's just a yes or no question that you need from your colleague, do you actually need to send an email in the first place? Okay, so why, why don't you just walk over to the person's desk or just text the person? But if it's... Um, if it's um, something more in depth regarding a project and there need to be a traceable, uh, there, there, there need to be a, a way you can trace back all the different uh, assignments, job scopes that have been done. I, it's very important that uh, your colleagues do use uh, the email to, to reply to you and, um, if you, I guess you, you will have to bring this matter up huh, to, to your team leader or to, to the head of the department. Okay, now we are at the last question, posted okay. in advance. Okay, this contains like a few sub-questions. Number one, under what circumstances do we need to have hard copies of emails? Number two, what are the pros and cons for various departments to use common email addresses? Number three, should we ignore the CC or the recipients when we reply? And the last one, how to avoid chains of short email? Okay. Under what circumstances do we then need to have hard copies? Again, this would be a company kind of policy. Um, I think certain companies, in my case, Mm, I'm trying to think now. <laughs> I have I have uh, printed out emails when we were dealing with the Securities Commission when we needed to uh, send out um, 
certain emails uh, on behalf of our clients. So, so there was a hard co no, there were hard copies of what transpired between uh, my department and the Securities Commission. So, again, like I said, company-wide policy. Huh? this would be uh, what are the pros and cons for various okay what, what does that mean uh? pros and cons for various oh okay so maybe it's just like um common email let's say just admin at pro.com or marketing at crow.com or sales um personally if i were to write to somebody uh in in an organization requesting for information or maybe i'll become a potential uh, uh client it would be nice to to have uh, i guess a name a name to the person like uh suzy at crow.com rather than just uh, masscom at crow.com um being able to have a name helps us to relate uh, uh, to have a more uh, interpersonal relationship uh, with with the uh, with the send, with the sender, so I would encourage I would encourage that um, pros for various departments. Well, if it's a very very small department <laughs> and you don't have many people, then maybe or you feel that it's. Uh, not necessary to create a lot of uh, names and um, yeah just go with just go with the common email address should we ignore the cc when we reply should we ignore um so like i said earlier the best way for you to decide who wants to be carbon copied is in your first email message to clarify and ask who in the CC recipient list uh, would like to continue receiving emails and who feels that it is not necessary, then a lot of uh, confusion can be cleared up. How to avoid chains of short email? Okay, what does, uh, what does it mean by chains of short email? Uh, oh, okay. Like the forward, is it the forward, forward, forward thing? A it lot is of like probably, uh, let's say, hi, Su Ping. Should we have the meeting at 10 o'clock? And then I reply, yes, it should be at 10 o'clock. And then you reply back again. Oh. Okay. In that case, uh, can we order lunch after the meeting? Okay. And then I will reply back. So I think I. Oh, okay. The question um, could be something like this. Oh, okay. And then I think, like I said, in the four point plan, <laughs> make sure under details and facts, list down everything so that uh, the person can make an informed decision. Huh? Hi, Susie. Uh, uh, our meeting is uh, going to be held at blah, blah, blah. Um, some questions for you to consider. Should there be lunch provided? Should there be tea provided? Should I photostat? I make copies of the uh, reports for everyone attending the meeting. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> so then I could answer all the questions that you have in one email to you, and that would cut the chain. Of, so, like I said, we um, when we sit down to compose an email, we need to give some thought to what, what can I say or what should I say so that um, the, the recipient can make an informed decision and uh, the person knows exactly what we want upon the first reading, okay? Okay, um, all right. So now let's move to, that is the last question that we have mm -hmm. on the question submitted earlier by our registered participants. So now I'm looking at the Q&A box. There are a lot of uh, similar questions that probably have been addressed by Sue okay. earlier in her presentation. Okay. So I will just choose those, uh, the one that totally sounds different, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. Okay, I have one question here from GE Ang. Usually okay. we react instantly to respond to an email that tends to accuse us of something or another, for example. Okay. Most of the time, this will escalate the issue and makes the matter worse. Yes. What would be the better way to handle this short of email in our daily working life? 
take 10 deep breaths. <laughs> I think, like I told you in my example, my former boss regretted her decision terribly. Uh, and she since then has never had a really, really good relationship with that person anymore. And it's very sad because, you know, they are both partners in a big four accounting firm. So walk away. And like I said, um, watch your email tone, watch your email tone. Um, uh, let's be the, the bigger person. Uh, and, and I think um, if we, if we, if we react positively or, or uh, we handle the situation well, I, 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 I know, I don't know. I, maybe I have a lot of faith in, in human nature. <laughs> I believe the other person um, may feel bad about sending you uh, such a, such a abrupt or rude or aggressive email. So again, like I said, um, if you are sending a work email on behalf of your company, uh, you should always think about how would this reflect on my company's image and my reputation, okay? As I said earlier, an email is forever, forever kept in the cloud. It's always, always traceable. So you can never take back anything that you, that you have once you have hit the send button, okay? And, and uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, since we have passed two minutes from our scheduled <laughs> webinar, so probably I will just take two more questions here. Okay. Okay, um, there's one question. Should we help the email recipient to reply the email if the recipient is not replying? Should the we? sender CC it to me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should call the email recipient and say, hey, <laughs> uh, um, you know, please do look into that email. I guess <laughs> this would be a, um, uh, <laughs> a personality thing. I don't know, but um, well, first of all, if you have informed the recipient to, to uh, respond to the email, and if you notice that within 24 or 48 hours, uh, uh, nothing has been done, um, you should maybe bring it up to your boss. Uh, and of course, if the thing is very, very urgent and within 24 hours, you have not noted uh, a response from your fellow colleague, I believe there is uh, nothing wrong in responding. If, if you know the answer, if you have the, the correct and accurate uh, answer or response required by, by the, the sender. Okay. okay. So we have the last question here. Below is the email of an email from one of my colleagues. No what? attachment. Please resend. Do you think it is okay? Uh, below is... The, this is the, I think this is the example of a oh, reply email okay. from one of my colleagues. Uh -huh. No attachment, please resend with the exclamation mark. Okay. Do you so, think it is okay? <laughs> exclamation marks, uh, we try to discourage huh? in email etiquette. Uh, experts in email etiquette have said that tone down on your exclamation marks. Um, it's a bit like shouting, huh? It's a bit like tone down on don't don't use capital letters all the time, especially if it's something uh, negative that you want to say. So um, maybe what the person could say is, um, I note that you've forgotten to attach, and uh, so or please please uh, attach uh, the email file that you have forgotten to do so in the first in the previous email. Okay, uh, so. Yeah, again, <laughs> like I said, the language is very, very important. Huh? The language is extremely important. Uh, a, a reflection of us, a reflection of our firm. So that's what I always, always uh, remind myself when I'm writing emails to people out of the, in the office and out of the office. Huh? It's a reflection of Crow. Huh? It's a reflection of me and Crow. Thank you so much, Shuping. So, yeah. 
uh, I think we have to end our session. <laughs> if there is any more questions that you feel that you want to be answered by Suping, you can actually email her or WhatsApp. Yes. And, um, yeah. Correct. I, I, I do conduct a lot of, like, this is just a brief summary of what I, I conduct in a proper class on how to write clearly and concisely, uh, it, both for report writing and for emails and even for grammar classes, uh, short and sweet grammar classes that kind of can help you uh, with tenses. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, Siu Ping, I think you have uh, some more slides to go on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oops, yes, so sorry. <laughs> uh, how can we assist you? Oh, yes. So I'm not the only one uh, who can help you if you require any soft skills training. Uh, I also have uh, fellow colleagues uh, who can do that. Um, and we have, uh, um, Crow has, uh, you know, brainstormed and, and come up with what we call a soft skills subscription plan, where, if I'm not mistaken, you can, you can attend our courses for as low as RM66 ringgit, right, per pack. <laughs> so that's a fantastic deal, all right? Um, and, and I'm very proud to say that Crow CPE together with uh, including myself and my fellow uh, soft skills trainer, we are all HRDF and MOF uh, accredited training providers. So um, you can claim for your, I think the HRDF uh, the benefits, you know, if, if you sign up for our training programs. So I hope, I, I really, really hope that um, if you have found this useful, do check out our uh, soft skills subscription plan. <laughs> and if you, uh, there are lots of interesting programs, like I told you, um, cross-cultural is so important now, especially since we can't meet the person face to face, that we are able to understand where the person is coming across uh, with regards to the different cultures, different personalities, and, and different negotiating skills. Okay. All right. Okay, so that marks our the end of the our uh, presentation. So hopefully you benefited from our session and we hope to see you again in our next Pro Learning Hour. Thank you, Suping. Thank you for everyone to thank join you, us. Susie. Yeah, All thank right. you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>